Hey, what's up everybody? My name is Russ, rwresearch.com. Today's presentation is in a different location. It's a little bit weird. You can probably hear the bugs in the background. It is officially almost nine o'clock. Uh, today's date is 10. Oh, these markers were played with by the kids. What is it? 10, uh, 17, 17. 10, 17, 17. See if you can see that okay. Um, Oh wow, it's all backwards on there. That's very bizarre, actually. It is actually backwards. Oh, I better check that. Oh, that's okay. Well, anyway, uh, the camera's flipped. So, sorry about the uh, weird presentation here. We're gonna do the best we can with what we got. Um, so I hope that the video series so far, this is video number seven. I can't believe I've made seven of them. They're all spaced a week apart. So that's seven weeks worth of uh, thinking. Um, hopefully, I've brought you guys along with me enough to kind of realize that um, the things we're trying to achieve are probably possible. Um, how to do that is something that is always a question and how to achieve the goal we're trying to reach. My job as a teacher, where I'm just trying to share what I'm thinking and these ideas and you know, my, 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 my job as a teacher is to make you do a little bit of your own thinking. And I think we have done that, especially on the first video of this series. And the other part of my job is to kind of make it a realization that actually it's possible to achieve these goals that we want to achieve. Um, so, you know, the last video seems to seem, seem to have been uh, accepted pretty well, which is a good thing because, I mean, it's nothing I really discovered in there. It's all about this nature, right? And uh, what, what does nature teach us? Uh, by the way, I'm cooking chicken. No, I'm not kidding. I'm cooking chicken at nine o'clock at night on the grill. It's not very hot, so it's a bit of a, a slow grill tonight. So I've got time to uh, make a video presentation. Actually, I made time to make the presentation. So, um, okay, so last week I asked you guys to look up cavitation and especially water hammer cavitation. Um, a lot of you guys have mentioned like ram pumps and venturis. And, uh, and these other ideas, which are great. Um, but I, I specifically want to talk about the idea of water hammer. So let me bring to your attention what that is. I don't know what color is gonna work great. We'll just make some crap brown here, our, <laughs> our pipe. Um, so I'm gonna, draw, I'm gonna draw a pipe here. And uh, Probably going to get this wrong, but I'm going to draw a valve and uh, we'll draw an inlet. So here's what I originally have been thinking about. Now I'm going to present this idea. Let me make sure you can see that okay. So I want to present this idea as just that it's an idea and it's, a, it's an idea that's been brewing in my head for way too long and now I want you guys to think about it with me. Um, we talk about energy from the vacuum, right? We talk about radiant energy and all these things, right? Radiant energy, so nature's energy, you know, energy from the vacuum, you know, the sea of energy, um, just these things. And so I thought, what's a good way to explain it in layman's terms that you can actually kind of make sense of? Uh, and some of those are like the Venturi effect and like a few of these ideas, but cavitation really hits me harder and especially water hammer cavitation. Um, so let's first talk about what water hammer is so if you have a uh, a reservoir i don't know if i'm in the way i'll have to stand off to the side but um i ain't got much room back here so if you have a uh well yeah okay i want to draw this better but we're just gonna have to deal with what we got so if i have a uh, a tank of water right and the water is going into this Right, and this is um, um, this is a valve. I think that's how you draw a valve with hydraulics. I don't remember to be honest, but that's okay. So if this is a valve, okay, and you have water flowing through this pipe, I'm not going to get mathy on you guys, but if you if you have water flowing in this pipe. Um, the, the, uh, the important thing here about this principle is that electricity acts much like a fluid and it's very mechanical. And that's why it's really cool to think about air and water in these mechanical systems because you can, 
you can actually demonstrate mechanically the same effect as electricity. Because what do they teach you? They teach you the pipe diameter is how much current you can push through and the, the head height of the water here, the higher it is, the more uh, voltage that you have, the more potential difference that you have. This is gravitational potential. Um, so that's why I'm bringing this up. So what happens in water hammer effect? So water hammer effect is when you, you open a valve and you close it and it's, and it's really destructive, right? It's a very destructive force. And um, I can't go into uh, great detail of um, the mathematics behind it, but I can tell you one thing. When you have water flowing through a pipe and you have an open end down here, so it's allowed to flow as, as much as it wants, or even, if, even not, but it, it could be a really long pipe. When you have current flowing in a wire or water in a pipe and you abruptly stop it, I mean you slam the valve shut here and there's a length of pipe on the other side, what happens? Okay, well actually the water has kinetic energy, it has momentum. So the water, right, the water continues to try to, to, try to go, but yet it can't. So what does it do? It creates a void. It creates a vacuum. So in this space right here, right? Oh, they're out making tire marks. You can't hear it. So what happens is the water continues to flow down the pipe. And what happens here? You actually get an air bubble. And, uh, and along with that, you probably get these little cavitation bubbles. But for the most part, this is completely filled with a vacuum. A void, right? A void. So this principle explains the same phenomenon or could explain the same phenomenon I was showing you on the oscilloscope when I was doing the cap to cap transfer. Um, when I was doing the cap to cap transfer, and I mentioned this in that video, that was my teaser, and now I'm kind of explaining it in a way that hopefully makes sense. Um, so you had you had traces like this, and then you had the, the transfer, right? Same thing here, so we had one at ground state, and we had the transfer like that, right? We had a, we had a circuit that was a, um, man, I really start, I need to start drawing <laughs> electrical components for you. So I had a, uh, I had a capacitor, and I had a, another capacitor, right? And I had a, uh, a diode here and I had a inductor here right and uh, the switch was right here right so I had a switch going through like this and so this one was at uh, 60 volts and this was at 0 volts and I was able to do this transfer so this is um, 60 this is 0 and I did this transfer and I demonstrated this, and then I wanted to show you a phenomenon, something very interesting, which was right here, you could see these little, oh, this marker is not very helpful. You could see these little, um, I should probably use the same color, little blips. Right? You could see these little blips off of the, uh, the system. And then a green trace was the voltage across um, the inductor, right, so I was actually measuring here, floating oscilloscope, and it was just flat line, and then all of a sudden it, you know, it, it, it had these, these peaks, yet there was no potential lost whatsoever, and I measured those, if you look closely on the screenshots I showed you, they were in the nanosecond range, like four, I think 4.2 nanoseconds or less? That was the oscillations that I was seeing. So that means the switch was opening and closing that fast. So my question to you is, if the inductor, right, in the system, and everything that's going on, if the wire is so long, right, if the wire is so long, that, what do they say? They say when you connect electrical potential, it's instant. The charge is instant because there are there are um, a bunch of free electrons in this copper wire, right? And these free electrons, and we're going to go into electron theory for a minute, right? Now here's the weird thing. This is positive and this is positive. 
this is negative and this is negative. So that's the, that's the difference between this circuit and a conventional circuit. But we know if this is at 60 volts, right, and this is at zero volts, we know the charge is gonna go over here. Um, and so as soon as you connect, right, as soon as you connect the switch, as soon as you connect the switch, the circuit knows that there is potential difference and current starts flowing. And it starts flowing from negative to positive, right? And that's the direction of the electron flow, from negative to positive. In this case, it would be from this side to this side according to the charge difference. Whether or not that's right, I don't know, but it should be this direction. So what happens is it knows it's connected and then all of a sudden you start having flow and it starts propagating. You can look at the speed that the propagation of electron or the current propagation down a wire takes time, but the circuit knows it's instantaneous, that it's connected because of all these free electrons. So electrons start flowing, and they start flowing, and they start flowing, and then they get right here. And then you disconnect the switch. Boom! Disconnect the switch. Well, if you disconnect the switch without the actual electron flow making it to this side, what happens? Okay. I mean, what happens? I, I, I prefer uh, the switch to be over here. I drew it wrong, according to my thinking. So this is the valve. This is the valve. If electricity is like water flowing in a pipe, it actually has inertia. That means if you disconnect this, this flow stops, right? And this flow tries to continue down the wire but it cannot make it down the wire because you've shut it off. And right here in this area, right, you create a void, a place where there is the opposite of what was there, which is the same thing here. Okay, so this is just a simple idea to ask the question. If you can turn on a circuit and turn it off faster than the propagation of the electrons or the current flow, what happens in this section of the wire? And if it's anything like this, which we know even Tesla said that electricity is like a non-compressible fluid, and I'm starting to see that because it has inertia. That's why you can do the flywheel idea with the inductor. So this is a, a, a poor representation of what I'm trying to express to you, and I got to go flip the chicken before it burns. So I ask you a question. What happens if you gave the circuit a potential? Okay, let's go back up here to the water real quick. Now, this is our reservoir, okay, but um, I also have uh, down here a little green bucket. And this little green bucket is full of water. And I thought to myself, what happens if I connect a pipe right here, right? I put a pipe here, um, and then I add a check valve, right? So we add a, a check valve like this, all right? So the water can only flow in this direction up into this system. When the water's flowing normally, you have a positive pressure down. But when you abruptly stop this and there's flowing water over here, you will get a huge, a huge void here. And there are videos online, which I will link in the description, which are awesome. They put a clear pipe and a high volume flow of water and you can see this massive um, cavitation or void that happens. It's not always the cavitation that you guys are thinking of. It's sometimes just a void. But what happens? Well, if you have potential lower than here, you can actually bring this water up. You will actually suck. You'll create a vacuum and you'll get water to flow into this void. Well, okay, that's great, Russ, but what are you really trying to tell me? Well, I'm trying to tell you that if this is your full potential, okay, then you can actually take potential lower 
than the, than the potential in your entire system. And you can get it into the pipe and you can actually fill as fast as it, you know, the vacuum isn't quite as much suction, suction as you would like, but it will pull up, especially if you had a really big pipe, it'll pull up a bunch of water in, in here. So the same thing down on this circuit, right? If I added a, uh, I think you guys can see the bottom of the board. If I added a ground, this isn't very good lighting. If I added a ground here, right? And I added a ground with, uh, uh, it should be, now that's actually backwards, isn't it? For it to come in, it would need to be the other way. But if it's the other way, then potential would flow. So you'd have to figure out a way to do that a different way. But if you were able, right, to, maybe you can do it, uh, I don't know, through some spark gap or something. Th these are ideas that I haven't had time to follow up on. Um, which is why I'm sharing them, so you guys can explore these, or if you already have, fantastic. But if you connected a ground, and I guess, let's do this, because we're playing with positive potential. Let's, let's actually do this right. You can do it with ground in the right system, but we're playing with positive potential. So let's do it a little bit differently. Let's say you have a, uh, you know, what Tesla called a, um, just a, a, a plate capacitor or a cold sink, all right, and you connected this plate capacitor or cold sink um, like this right here, all right, then ask yourself, if you have a bunch of free electrons in the air on this charged, you know, plate that's just floating in the air, it's gathering ambient radiant free electrons within the air that we breathe every day. And, and you can actually create this water hammer effect in the electrical wire, right? If you think like Newman, why do you think Newman had so much wire? He had miles and miles of really big wire. Well, he's using switch contacts, which means you can get them to switch pretty fast. Although those weren't too fast. But the point is, is that that massive amount of wire allows you to build up a big magnetic potential and it allows you to do also a very simple phenomenon such as this and if you can let the system suck in free electrons then you actually get more potential than you than you started with within the pipe you have more water than you started with here it's all at the same state but it's in the pipe and here you can add electrons so again just thinking outside the box here and trying to explain the water hammer effect and explain it in a way that makes sense with an electrical circuit. And I want you guys to chew on this, brew on this, think about this. And if you can do it with an inductor, right? So now we're gonna add an inductor in this line, All right? We'll call it L1, all right? And we're using the switch as the diode, right? We're going in the back opposite direction here. Oh, we're talking about current flow. Right, if you can make this system do the transfer just like we could here, we ended up with what? We ended up with 58 volts here and 2 volts here. So ask yourself, could you make up, you know, in the right scenario, could you make up the extra 2 volts of potential with a system like this? Um, there's also one more thing to note here. I really gotta flip my chicken. Um, there's also one more interesting thing to note here, which is as soon as the valve closes, there's this horrendous just slamming of the entire system. And it's more than just this. It's actually something that happens like in a different time frame than just this. So I post two videos in the link uh, in I post two videos in the description. One of them is really cool. I think it's a setup where they actually are testing water hammer in these big pipes. They're like, I don't know, four inch pipes or something. And the whole system just rips itself literally off of its own, you know, bolted down system. Cause it's a pipe with a head height and then a loop. And then I think it goes back up and they're purely just testing this type of stuff. And they've got really cool video of this. It's so destructive that the, the kinetic, 
Ah, well, apparently it was time to flip the chicken. My battery died. So anyway, the idea here is, is this a, an easy way to create a disruptive discharge system and allow the system to generate its potential? But in my mind, you have to add this input, right? You have to add this input. If you look at a lot of Tesla's work, I mean, he's got aerial antennas and he's got ground systems. I mean, he's using the potential of the earth in that case, right? Literally to do similar scenarios. You know, if you were driving an oscillating system and you connected a positive and a negative charge or two negatives charge or something, and when you, when you started creating the resonance effect, if you allowed extra electrical potential, extra electrons or whatever the case may be, if you were allowing that extra potential to get into your system specifically by tying it to ground or an aerial antenna or something you know in that sort of system you know you're inviting nature into your circuit um, not that it can't happen any other way um, I think that there's some other special things with uh, a collapsing magnetic field but we're not going to get into that right now um, so that's it on this particular subject I want to talk about a few more things and then I'll uh, I'll let you guys go I don't want to make this too long but this is important, I think. And this is what I was seeing here. I was seeing no loss of charge potential because it never made it around the circuit, in my opinion. And then all of a sudden, when it went through, it went all the way through, and this, this guy was like flatline. That really should be a flat line. There were some, there were some uh, little, little peaks and spikes and random spots, but you know, before current flows, when the switch tries to close, right literally before current can make it through the circuit and then here current is already flowing and you try to shut it off and you get the same phenomenon but different on the other side of the circuit uh, and we're going to get into component placement next which is very interesting so let's get on over to that i'm gonna clean this board off all right you can hear the locusts or crookets or whatever they are it might not pick up very well this mic's pretty good at cutting that stuff out but hopefully it's not too bad so look, um, I've been just doing a lot of thinking and that's where these ideas come from, talking to people and brainstorming with people and people who have different views on this stuff. And I'm just trying to share that with you so that you can come and join the fun and try to actually put some effort into the ideas that we have here and give me your feedback, give me your thoughts, give me your experiences. Um, and one of, the, one of the interesting things that I come across is um, is that, that science doesn't really know what a field is. It, it can't give you a real understanding of what a field is. So in some person's views, magnetic field, electric field, um, electromagnetic field, right? The propagation of photons, like all of this um, simple, basic, right down to the basic principles, science, can only give you its best guess that isn't real well understood at all. We have great electron theory and we got a great this and a great that and we, we got a bunch of stuff but for some reason there's a few things uh, such as what a field is and so some people think it's all fields and it's field interactions and that's a whole new science. I'm not going to get into that right now. Um, so what I wanted to talk about is um, the idea of component placement. So if I have a positive potential here and uh, I place a, a diode here. I'm sorry that this is going to be pretty basic for some of you, but some of you will learn. And I have a negative potential here. Okay. If I add uh, the, uh, the diode here, these two circuits in something, let's say, such as a patent, are okay you can draw it however you want but when you switch these two components around something completely different happens now the best way to think about this is this let's say we wanted to create cavitation right uh, or or the water hammer effect you'd have to place these components a special way and put the switch in the right spot in order to achieve that goal Right, you could add your switch here. You could add your switch here. All of these do technically the same function in a way. 
yet they react totally different in the circuit. So one of these would act more like a ram pump, where it would actually be pumping electricity out instead of doing the reverse, and one of these would be like cavitation or creating a void. So I just, I just, I think it's interesting to note that, you know, somebody can really screw you up. When you write down a schematic and you're looking at someone else's work and you're trying to replicate it, don't think that just because there's a capacitor and inductor that switching the sides and putting them in a different orientation won't screw the entire system up. And this is something that I think a lot of people do on accident and I wanted to point it out because it's actually very important. Component placement is very, very important. And you can think about it mechanically, just like water in a pipe. So next, this is the last thing I want to cover. I've been doing this very interesting cap to cap transfer because it allows me to do interesting things and keep half the potential no matter what according to the uh, capacitor paradox. So I really like this split the positive idea. Um, and so there's a few questions that I have to ask. So right now, if I connect the circuit with a wire, right, what did I just do? Well, let's remove the wire and let's look at the circuit. Are these capacitors in parallel or series? Right? Right now they're all in series. But, if I connect a wire, these are now in parallel. And some people are like, well that's real obvious. Well, here's the thing. This side of the circuit is completely isolated from this side of the circuit. So, there, there is current flowing in this wire because you're on the other side of the circuit and the charges are going to want to balance out. So my question is, is if you put a load here, right, then you could actually put a load here. And why is that important? Well, you'll have to do some bench experiments and I actually need to do a few more bench experiments and I was going to hope to I hope to get to this in this video, but I didn't get time to finish those experiments. But what's interesting about this is you have a dielectric separation between these circuits. And that's actually very important. Because what if you had a circuit like this? Okay. So I had positive potential here, I had a switch here, I closed the switch, the potential comes to this side, to this positive, and now I'm trying to balance out those positives through a full transfer, a single cycle, let's say. Well, you've tied this to earth ground, which allows for a different thing to happen. Now you're allowing nature to fill these negative reservoirs and something else will, will happen. Not the same effect as something where you close it like this, right? Um, and then there's something else that's very interesting to note, which is playing with all these circuits. Uh, this is the last thing I'll talk about because I need to go finish my chicken. <laughs> oh, I should leave this up here, but that's okay. So there's one, there's one other interesting thing I want to point out. There's a thing called... Um, usually you see this in a very specific way. All right, so you get a, uh, low voltage and high voltage transformer. I'm sure that color sucks, but anyway, you get a oscillating circuit. This can be uh, 60 cycles a second. And over here, you've got high voltage. You've got a neon sign transformer. Well, there's many things you can do, but Tesla did one very interesting thing. He connected the circuit like this. Remember me playing with the Tesla hairpin circuit? Now, he also added a spark gap. 
But he added it in a very strange place. He added it there. So, this is actually a very interesting phenomenon. And there's a guy on the internet that really did some cool research on this. Right? This is a dead short. And you can actually take a light bulb and you can just attach it here and attach it here. And you can run it all the way over here across some super fine wire. And you can actually light up a light bulb. And this wire can be, you know, 50 AWG, right? Smaller than your hair. And yet you can light up this uh, 500 watt halogen light bulb across that. Okay. So what you're doing is you're putting this light, you're putting a resistance, right? What's happening on this side of the circuit is different than what's happening on this side of the circuit. This side of the circuit is oscillating and creating massive discharges. And this side of the circuit, okay, is creating a whole new different thing. It's different. It's more really when you get into radio frequencies and uh, other stuff like that. I know this isn't super helpful, but I'm trying to point something out. You see this circuit, and you see this circuit. So the idea between splitting the positive and trying to save your, conserve your charge by transferring it back and forth is kind of exactly like what's going on over here, where you've completely isolated this half of the circuit through the dielectric field of these capacitors, which gives you some other things that you can do with the circuit. And this is Tesla's hairpin circuit. And it's very cool because you can tap off of it. This is just a dead short. Right, you're just oscillating the field in there, and it has these discharges, disruptive discharges, allowing. Um, and there's something there's something to talk about with light in a spark gap, because anytime you have that, you have the potential for an incoming source, in my opinion. Um, and so that's very interesting. Something side note, um, but you know you have this you have this very interesting circuit. And you're allowed to do this with it, and it resembles very close what I've been doing with, with the split positive capacitor. So I just wanted to point that out. I just was messing with the idea and trying to think about it myself and, and look at the system and why this happens and how this happens. How you can transmit 500 watts of resistive electrical load in light down a, a wire that's smaller than your hair, you know, 30 feet long. How does that work? And... Uh, it's very similar to this whole conversation that we've been having for this video. Um, I guess that's it. I, uh, I have more to discuss and more things to think about. But honestly, I'm just trying to uh, uh, take it a little, little easy. And I want you guys' feedback. And this is, a this is a debate. This is a discussion. This isn't me saying this is be all, say all, do all. This is me trying to say, hey, what happens when you set up a system like this? Can you let nature fill the circuit with its own... Uh, way that the circuit works um, and there's a very interesting uh, I'm gonna read I'm gonna read one more let me read something this is actually what I was gonna do this is the last thing and uh, it'll be short but let me flip the chicken okay this goes back to the question of does the load consume the energy there were some more important points I was gonna talk about there's one key thing I'm just gonna throw it out there because I don't have time to just express it in the way I really want to but you can generate a magnetic field in ambient room temperature almost with no energy consumption if you do it right right if you transfer the energy from one place to the other you can gen generate a magnetic field with almost no losses and that's actually pretty cool because that means you can use that magnetic potential to do work now there's a really cool thing uh, these people are actually taking a superconducting magnet and storing electrical potential in the magnetic field. They are calling these magnetic storage devices. Now you gotta cool these things into superconducting conditions, but when all the, uh, when, when the system has no restriction of electron flow, friction in a wire, right? That is friction. That's also what I was gonna talk about. Um, so friction in a wire, um, 
you know, when, when you get a friction in a wire and you start thinking about what that, wh what that is, well, if you can get rid of it in a superconductor, you can actually store the mag, the electrical potential in the magnetic field alone, and that's what they're doing, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, let's go back to that real quick, because this is what I'm going to be talking about, and so I'm going to go ahead and express it. Um, so I got a quick question for you. If I have two air tanks, <laughs> back to this, if I have two, well, let's just have one air tank. Remember, we don't care where we got the air at this point, right? If I have right here a motor, and out to atmosphere, okay? If I have 100, if I had 100 PSI, okay, does the load consume the energy? This was the question I wanted to bring up. Um, here's my question. When you release air, right, through a system like this, the air actually gets cold. A thermodynamic reaction is the air getting cold. When you compress it, it gets hot. So when you release it, it gets cold. Now that's an interesting phenomenon in itself because you gotta ask yourself, if you were to walk up, right, and touch this air motor in a system that's operating, you would find out that that air motor actually is hot, right? It's hot, so therefore it's friction, right? There's friction in the motor itself, which is generating the heat. So therefore the question is, is in, ele it, 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 in an electrical load, does the same phenomenon happen where this motor, even though the compressed air being released is being, is getting cold, the friction in the motor is generating heat. You can still you remember, if, the, if you save some of this air, like the water, <clears throat> you let nature replenish the air somehow, then you would be having this motor run uh, with no use of potential, and yet it's creating heat. So you gotta ask yourself, where is that heat coming from? It's, it's coming from friction. So when I think about a wire and electricity, I think about friction as literally that, it's friction generating the heat, right? And that is still a question that needs to be really sought out. But does the load consume the energy? And if it doesn't, where does the light come from, right? Where, just the same question I asked in the last video, where does the light come from? Well, it's resistance, there are electrons bouncing around, right? And I don't wanna get into this right now, but if you've got electrons, on, on, on these rings of an atom, according to electron theory, you can actually get an electron to hit this guy, jumps up a ring, well, instantly it wants to fall back down. It, when it wants to fall back down, it gives off a photon. And so this, this uh, ele electrons hitting each other generate the potential difference of the rings being jumped, which creates photons. You guys, if you don't know anything about that, that's why I didn't want to talk about it right now, you can go look it up. But anyway, the question is, is you know, in, does this process cons consume the energy or do you just need the electron flow to generate this effect? Um, and then again, the magnetic field thing, you can generate a magnetic field, you can actually store electrical potenti potential in a superconducting magnet. It's, it's a really crazy thing to think about. That means you can generate a magnetic field with no losses and you can oscillate or you can store, you can do whatever you want with no losses. It really opens up the imagination to what's possible. And you, the cool thing is you can do that almost in room temperature with the same, with very few losses except for whatever the, uh, the resistance of the wire is. So if you can generate a magnetic field with a huge wire and you can, you can do a cap to cap transfer with almost no losses, you could do some pretty cool stuff with that magnetic field. You could do work with the magnetic field with almost no losses of electrical potential. All right, so I had to get that out. There was a thought that I forgot. I wanted to tell you and I forgot. Okay, so real quick, I'm talking to my buddy. Um, you know who you are. I don't have to tell you. This is on the forums. He asked a question about does the, does the, uh, um, does the load consume the energy? And he says, I'm beginning to suspect y'all. He said y'all. I don't think he's from Kentucky, but I'm from Indiana, so I'm used to this. Are avoiding, okay. I'm beginning to suspect y'all <laughs> are avoiding my question. The question is, is it possible to transfer energy back and forth between two or more storage devices by way of some load, which is performing useful work, in this case, magnetism, and recoup enough extra energy from the load to keep these transfers going in perpetually? Yes or no, why or why not? This was my response. 
No. If you're suggesting that the system is in a closed box, closed to the environment, which is almost impossible. And then why? Why, why, the, why is the answer no? Because you're not allowing anything to go in or out. So whatever work you perform will not be able to be replenished the way nature would do it. This is if your storage device was charged when it went in the box. So if it was charged when it went in the box, uh, then that means you have one cycle or a couple of cycles and that's it, right? And then I said yes to the question of can you do what I asked in the first place? Yes, if you place your system in a place of natural replenishment, the way nature wants to do it. Why? Because nature has a way. Lightning, anyone? Right? Lightning can fill up a cap capacitor pretty easily. And then, I, and then I try to make it a little easier to understand. It's the same thing as asking if water can be used as potential over and over and over if you put it in a black box. And I said, well, not if you want the water to run a turbine. turbine. Okay, you need the sun with a plastic sheet on top. It must be brought to the top again. Okay, but Russ, how can, how can the load not consume the energy? Well, the water, okay, well, is the water at the top or the bottom when you close the lid? If it was at the top, you get one cycle and that's it. Okay. Now, um, then I said, uh, you know, you, if it's at the top, you get one cycle, you use up all your energy. If it was at the bottom, you, then you're screwed. <laughs> you, don't, you got nothing. But, do you have the same amount of water in the box? So you, your water is always in the box. It's a closed box. You can't get it out. You can't get it in. It's always the same amount, right? It's always the same amount. Okay, get a plastic lid and put it where the sun shines. The water in the box is in a closed system but open to the environment, to the ambient light. So somebody could close their mind and go, well, if I look at this water in a box, it's actually closed in the box, but yet it's open to the environment. But most people would say, no, it's just in a closed box, like a closed circuit. But actually you gotta keep your mind open that any circuit in the air, any circuit in the ambient, right, is actually in the environment, okay? Let me go take the chicken off and I'll finish this thought. All right, chicken. Done. Might be a little overdone. Shh. Anyway, um, so, okay. And I said, so is this not true? And then I said, oh, you don't like the plastic lid? Okay. Seal the box off completely. Paint it black. Put it where? Well, put it somewhere where there's enough heat for the water to get hot enough to condense on the lid and it will drop back down. It's a completely closed system, yet open to the environment. This is the important part of any of this research is you got to keep your mind thinking, oh, open to the environment. Okay, this guy said, okay, fine. Allow me to make another bold statement. All systems are open to nature, all of them. There is no such thing as a closed system, period. Now answer my question again. All right, I said, put the box in the shade with a plastic lid on it and you can question yourself. Is it possible to get a self runner? That's what we ask ourselves all the time, isn't it? Is it possible to get a self runner? I got a closed system. I got water in there. I got a, a, a turbine and I got a closed system. It's in the shade. I said, well, it's not possible to get a self-runner if you haven't discovered the sun yet. Right? If you're walking around saying, well, I don't know how this is possible. I don't know how this is possible. I don't know how this is possible. And somebody walks up and says, put it in the sun. See what happens. Right? If you didn't, if you didn't discover the sun yet, well, you'd be stuck with lifting the water back up yourself. And then find out, are you nature as well? Something to think about. I, I don't see why it's not possible. It just needs to be done. And I have this quote that I have, which may be helpful. I have two quotes that I have on all my posts. One of them is, no man invents anything. He builds and extends a little with his friends and on the shoulders of others. Dr. John Vincent A. 
I can't say it, A-T-A-N-A-S-O-F, and stuff. And then my personal quote is, if you believe, even though you cannot see, you will see. That's biblical. That's the truth for these type of systems. If you believe, even though you cannot see, you will see. If you believe there's a sun and you have a closed system in a box, eventually you'll see the light. Okay? Like I said, read the Bible more. Maybe it'll help you. Maybe it'll motivate you. Maybe you'll see other things in your life turn around. And it's all part of this mentality of helping and sharing and thinking and being kind to one another and all this kind of stuff I keep expressing. So that's it for this video. I hope you liked it. Um, I have so much to talk about. And it's like if I don't make the video right when I'm really in deep thought, then I have a hard time re-expressing it. So I hope I expressed what I was trying to tell you fair enough. Um, and, and, and I'm a little tired and it is now uh, 1045, so this video is very long. Peace out. God bless. Have a good day. Thank you. Leave me a comment. Let me know what your thoughts are. Debate the idea of water hammer and if it's a possibility to put something in the system. Uh, in that mentality of thinking on an electrical standpoint. And also the idea of allowing current to flow and shut it off before it ever reaches the other side of the potential difference. What happens in that scenario? And can it create an electrical water hammer? And can you create a void where nature can fill it in? These are questions to think about. See you later. I hope you enjoyed the outside laboratory behind my house. And yeah, I wasn't kidding. I'm actually cooking chicken over there, but I'm done now. <laughs> Peace out.